Okay. <clears throat> Seven o'clock, so I guess we'll get started. I want to introduce myself. I'm Donna Laguerre, president of Appalachia Audubon Society. And welcome to our November program meeting. I want to thank you for registering and participating tonight. I'm really excited to learn more about eBird. I've been out in the field with some other birders that use it, and um, I'm always wondering how are they doing that? So I hope that I will learn to, to uh, use it tonight. But first, a few announcements. First, there will be no program meeting in December, and that's usual. We don't normally have one in December. Uh, second, we will resume on Thursday, January 21st at 7 p.m. for a program about the forests and their management within the Leon County Park System. Our speaker will be Lee Davis, Director of Parks and Recreation for Leon County. That's January 21st. And please save the date, Thursday, excuse me, February 18th for an evening you won't want to miss. Our program called Pines to Palms, celebrating our community forests. We are hosting a broad reaching, inspiring event to recognize preservation of forests in Wakulla County. And we're hoping that next year we'll do something similar with Leon County Forests uh, to provide new ideas and insights into the importance of forests and to catalyze action for continued protection and enjoyment of forests. Our event will include an old growth forest network that's a national organization award ceremony for selected forests and a presentation by celebrated forest ecology author and network founder, Joan Maloof. The program also includes a panel discussion hosted by Tom Flanagan of WFSU's Perspectives. The panelists will reflect a diversity of perspectives on the importance of forests. So watch our website for details, that's appalachie.org. Another announcement, the traditional wildlife friendly yard tour is canceled for this year, though we are working on a possible substitution for this. And I want to thank all of you who donated to the construction of a bat house for Lake Alberta Park. We have received enough to build the house but are continuing to accept donations to fund an interpretive sign about bats for the Southside Park where Appalachia Audubon Society continues to volunteer to make it a more inviting place for people and wildlife. To donate, use the donate button on our website, appalachia.org. You can also mail in a check, write Bat House on the memo. See our website for the mailing address. Also on the website, you can find our video that we made ourselves of Rob Williams yard, illustrating how he converted a traditionally landscaped yard of mostly lawn to one that is bursting with native plants and the wildlife that uses these plants. Now, here is our program chair, Ben Rangel, to introduce our speakers. Thanks again for tuning in tonight and enjoy the program. Uh, hello everyone, uh, as Donna said, my name is Ben Ringel and I'm on the uh, programming committee for Appalachia Audubon Board of Directors. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we start, um, just so you know, everyone is muted except for the panelists. Um, and we ask that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you're on a, on a desktop and you move your mouse, you'll see all those functions pop up at the bottom. One of them is Q&A. If you want to pop the questions in there and not in the chat, it makes it a lot easier for us. Um, and feel free to ask questions at any time, but uh, we won't be answering the questions until they end. Um, so I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Peter Kleinhens and Heather Levy tonight, who are going to present about eBird. Um, Peter, uh, he works at Tall Timbers. He's the Osceola River Watershed Coalition Coordinator, which is a huge task. He's basically trying to save the Osceola River from development or anything might happen to it. Um, he was also the former president of Appalachia Audubon and 
really took this chapter uh, to new places. So he's um, a really hard worker. And then there's Heather, Heather Levy, who um, I guess was a graduate student at UGA. She actually just defended her thesis today. So I don't even know how she's awake, but um, congratulations to her. She's a great student, really hard worker. She also has worked at Tall Timbers a lot. And um, I think now she can definitely say that she's an expert in cavity nesting birds, old growth, long leaf, all of that stuff. Um, I think she's currently working as an avian biologist at Tall Timbers. And um, she's also on the board of directors, they both are um, for Appalachia Audubon. And Heather has been working really closely with um, our sustainability fellow from FSU to get the Bat House project off the ground. So we're really appreciative of that. So two really hardworking board members right here. Um, they're also both excellent birders. Um, I've had the pleasure, I've, they, I consider them both very good friends of mine and I've had the pleasure of going out birding with them very often. I'm not a birder, um, but I always learn a lot. It's pretty amazing what they know. And you know, they're, they're always like kind of riffing off each other and stuff and arguing a little bit, but that's always really funny. Um, Peter is a consummate interpreter. If you've ever been able to walk with him on a field trip, it's amazing, you learn so much and his enthusiasm is real and it's, it's catching. Um, so he makes any trip really fun. And Heather is, she's actually the better birder. So they, they might argue over that, but it's true. Um, she has an incredible amount of knowledge and she's really excellent at, at identifying birds by sound. And it's just astounding when you go out with them what you learn. Um, but besides just being naturalist and working in the field, I know they both feel really strongly that you can't just enjoy nature. You have to actually help conserve it. And they both worked really hard to do that. Um, and I think eBird is one of the ways that they see that you know, uh, us regular folk can contribute to science um, and get information to scientists from the field that they may not be able to reach. So without any further ado, I'll let them talk to you about that, Peter and Heather, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Ben, very much. And thanks everybody for being here and Appalachia Audubon, of course, for giving us the chance to, to talk about something we love. So I'm gonna share the screen right quick and we will get started. All right. Um, so as Ben said, um, today, basically what we're gonna be talking about is birding in general, but more specifically eBird, which is this, in our opinion, excellent tool, one, for getting engaged with birding, but two, for contributing to the larger community of both birds and people, um, helping birds, helping people. And so um, we're really excited to talk about this, if you can't tell, um, it's something we love. And with that, we will start diving in. So for starters, every time I give a presentation, I think it's important to set, set the stage. How are these two people qualified to talk about this? Well, um, Heather is a better birder than me, but we both bird a lot, um, but we're, there's people way better than us. And we're the first to admit that. However, we do use eBird, um, for a while there, we were using it almost every day uh, for a long time. So we are very familiar with the app and the website. Um, Heather, of course, has been mentioned, um, is an avian biologist. So she's studying this stuff for a living. Um, that's her climbing a longleaf pine. Um, chances are, if I tried doing that, I would fall off the ladder. So she's got more skills than me in that department as well. Um, but Heather and I, you know, we, we bird a lot. And last year, we we decided that we were gonna try a big year, which is, if you haven't seen the movie or know what that is, it's basically where you try to see as many birds as possible in a year in a particular geographic location. For us, it was the United States. So that's us uh, freezing in Colorado, looking for rosy finches. Um, and then that top right image is Heather snapped of me in Duluth, Minnesota, the first week of January of last year. So. Uh, you can imagine how I was feeling during that photo, so but cold. it was so cold. But we we use eBird a lot, and we track down a lot of birds. Last year, um, we didn't hit our goal of 500 species. We got 458 last year um, in the U.S., which we were excited about. Saw some cool stuff, and you know, just got that much more into this hobby. And so, um, speaking of the hobby, what is what is birding? A lot of people talk about it, but what is it actually? Um, as far as we're concerned, birding is, first off, uh, it often involves a passion, um, a deep passion for birds, 
And that passion usually quickly transitions to obsession. Um, I think everybody on this webinar probably knows at least one person who is truly obsessed with birds. You're looking at two of them right now. Um, but the actual act of birding is just actively seeking birds, whether it's in your backyard, whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in Antarctica. And that can be visually, but it can also be via sound. Uh, there's a lot of times we go out and all we're doing is marking down what we are hearing uh, just to kind of challenge ourselves. Um, the diversity of birds is just incredible. These are a selection of birds we saw just last year, everything from common stuff, um, but still cool stuff like this roseate spoonbill up here, um, the scrub jay, which is only found in Florida. It's close relative, the green jay, which is only found in a couple of counties in the United States along the Mexican border. Um, and probably one of our most exciting birds last year of several was this Lucifer hummingbird, which is uh, normally not even found in the US, um, but we were lucky enough to see it in southeastern Arizona. So birding just, it, it's always full of surprises. It's always fun. And I guess it's important to explain why even be a birder in the first place. If you're not into birding, why try? I mean, okay, they're just birds and I don't really care about birds. Um, Hopefully you do, but if you don't, there's side benefits. Um, first off, birding is really straightforward if you're into natural history. I used to be a herper, I still am, but I focus more on birds. But I would go out a lot, uh, Ben of all people knows better than anybody, and fail and not see anything I was looking for. I've never had that problem with birds. Every time we go out and we look for birds in any place, we see them, they're everywhere. Um, birding forces you to get outside a lot. And it's good, that's, we know that's good for our mental and our physical health. Um, most importantly for us, birding is very uh, economical. Uh, Heather and I could not bird at the rate we do. Um, and we have friends who are doing big years and stuff. I mean, all these people could not do it if it wasn't cheap to do. Um, if you can afford gas and get from point A to point B, even on a small scale, you can bird. And here we are in Tallahassee, which is you know, a hot spot for birding. You can get, Hundreds of species literally within an hour of Tallahassee, uh, as long as you, you put in the effort. Um, two of my uh, weak points are patience and attention to detail. Um, and birding really trains me in both of those things because you have to, if you see a little warbler up in a tree, 80, 90 feet off the ground, and you're trying to follow it, it's so frustrating. You just have to be patient and look at it. And you also have to know enough and educate yourself constantly enough to understand what's its plumage. What does it look like in fall or spring? What does it sound like? What's, it, what's it, the difference between its call and its song? And you have to pay attention to all those details and be patient and actually have the skill of seeing stuff to, to find that bird. Um, birding is very rewarding though. Sometimes you're looking and looking and looking and you strike out, but then that bird flies in and lands on the shrub in front of you. And we had that a lot last year and it's magic. I mean, it's just incredible when that happens. And you've spent so much time and energy looking for something that's gorgeous bird flies in. Um, finally, birds show up everywhere, like I mentioned. We've been in the middle of a farm field. We've been in someone's backyard. We've been in sewage plants, you name it, because birds just show up places. And so you get to all these places you'd never normally go. And along the way, you meet a lot of interesting people, people from all walks of life uh, we met last year. And some of them we still stay in touch with. So there's a variety of reasons in addition to just how cool birds are to become a birder. It's also no secret that bird populations have declined precipitously over the last 50 or so years. Um, it seems that almost every older birder that I talk to that's been birding for a long time um, always talks about how things used to be. When we're out, they point at a pond and say that used to be teeming with ducks. Um, that tree over there used to be teeming with migrant warblers and orioles. My feeders used to be teeming with hummingbirds in the winter. Um, and it just seems that every year our baseline as to what is normal kind of keeps shifting downwards. Um, and obviously that's really heart-wrenching. A lot of us are probably familiar with this paper that came out um, last November, The Decline of the North American Avifauna um, by Rosenberg et al. And that was the big pu publicity that got um, published all over and basically claimed that 3 million birds have been lost, sorry, 3 billion birds have been lost um, since 1950. 
And that's, that's a really steep decline. And this is not just subject to some of our rare and uncommon birds. This is occurring to some of our most common birds like finches and blackbirds. Um, this is just a figure adapted from that paper that shows the decline of some habitat specific species like our forest birds declining 22%, shorebirds 37, and grassland birds have really seen a large decline of 53%. There are just so many threats to birds, um, including obviously climate change, habitat loss, habitat alteration, and mismanagement of habitat, um, collisions with human infrastructures, uh, pesticides, outdoor cats, the list really is endless. And because this is not just restricted to one spatial scale, it makes understanding declines and differences in movements a really big challenge. Those of us in the conservation world already know that funding and personnel are always limited. You never have enough money and you never have enough people that you want to conduct a study. Um, so there's this really critical need for, for these countrywide and even global wide observers. Well, enter eBird. eBird was launched in 2002 by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and uses data from birders. Uh, making it one of the world's largest biodiversity related citizen science projects. Um, with birders active globally, eBird is also international in scope. Um, super importantly, it's free and open access. So anybody with internet capability or a smartphone can use it. This makes it accessible to both birders and to researchers alike. Um, the site stores bird observations from birders that upload checklists um, and also media like photos, videos, and audio recordings of bird calls and songs. Um, besides keeping track of, of lists for yourself, one of the primary uses for birders of using eBird is the ability to find target birds that you want for your list, as well as um, really good birding areas at any time of the year, anywhere. So just like iNaturalist, just like Facebook, just like Twitter, um, you have to create an account for eBird. And sometimes when I give presentations about iNaturalist and these other things, people are like, oh, I don't want to create an account. All right, if you, if you can write your name, you're good um, with this account. It's that's, that simple. You need your first name, your last name, a username that's unique, and then a password and your email. Um, so once you create this account, that enables you to use eBird. It also, though, enables you to have a profile just like on Facebook and these other things. You can use a profile photo and a bio to kind of say who you are. But most importantly, eBird catalogs your finds. So maps are displayed of states, counties, countries you've been to, all these things and the birds you've seen. And so sometimes when I'm exceptionally bored, I will stalk people I know and see what their, what their eBird uh, ranking is and it's it's kind of fun because you see like where people have been and it's a great conversation piece next time you see somebody I don't know it's just it's kind of fun um, and it, it drives competition and birding is rife with competition but friendly for the most part um, so diving in a little bit deeper you might have heard us mention already that eBird is on the website eBird.org but there's also a smartphone app and the point I really want to drive home is that I don't think one is better or worse than the other. I like both in tandem. I think they both kind of benefit each other. So you'll see here um, for the mobile app, which is just a download, this second image, if you can see my cursor here, is kind of what it looks like when you open the app. It's got the date, the time, uh, you can turn record track on. So when you're out birding, it actually tracks you and tells you the distance you've gone. Um, and then you hit start checklist and you're birding. When you hit start checklist, um, you'll have downloaded a pack for the state you usually bird in or state you're visiting or country you're visiting. And basically you just type in what you see here or you just go to the bird and you just click the plus button each time you see something or you type in the number. It's, that's it. And then when you're done, you just submit it. Heather will talk a little bit about that, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, in addition, eBird about a year ago unveiled something really exciting for me. I love going to new places to explore. Heather does too, a lot of our friends do. And there's actually a function, this explore function in eBird. And if you have your location on on your phone and you go to that, all the birding hotspots within 50 miles of you will display. 
And so you'll see these hotspots. And we'll talk about what hotspots are in a second. But um, these are all hotspots. And those red ones are places where people have birded within the last seven days. So if you're driving through an area, you can say, man, I need a rest stop. I've been on I-10 for five hours and I want to stop. And we just did that recently back in September. And we pull up eBird and there'd be a spot five miles away and we go check it out. And it's, it's great. And the cool thing is you can click on those hotspots and within the app route directly to the spot. So I know a lot of you um, and a lot of us have been frustrated because we're trying to find some obscure entrance to a WMA or something and it's a pain to pull it up on your phone. This routes directly to it, no matter how obscure. So I love that. Um, the benefits of the website, on the other hand, are that that's the only place you're going to be able to upload media, like sound or um, photos or video, which is really helpful sometimes. And we'll get into that. It's also easier to investigate. Some of the functions, like exploring species and hotspots and things, profiles, are just easier when you have a larger screen. Um, so I like to use both, and I think both are advantageous for different reasons. And I would encourage anyone thinking about getting involved with eBird or getting involved more to check out the functionality of both. So if you really don't want to use the mobile app, or maybe you don't have a smartphone and can't download the mobile app, just recording a checklist on paper and uploading it to the site is absolutely fine and acceptable. Um, and so you're going to go to eBird.org. There's a big submit button right at the top. And the first thing you're going to do is describe where you birded. So you're going to first, oops, you're going to first uh, either choose from one of your, your locations if you've already birded there. You can find it on the map. You can use lat long. Um, you can select an entire city, county, state, or country, which is uh, really not recommended because if you report a Western kingbird from the United States, that's not necessarily very helpful for someone who's trying to find that Western kingbird. So when you can always use more specific area um, and you can also import, import data from a spreadsheet. Second, you're gonna put in your date and effort. So your observation date, your observation type. Um, traveling means your purpose was to go out and to bird. You traveled some distance to, to look at birds. Um, stationary indicates you were sitting at a fixed location and walking bird, watching birds. So for example, your backyard, or if you're at a feeder station at a national park or something like that. Um, incidental refers to your main purpose wasn't birding, but you saw a bird maybe you really needed for your list. Um, birders are notoriously really bad drivers um, because we're on the highway and we see hawks flying over the highway and we're going like this, trying to look at the hawks. Um, but it happens to be a really cool hawk that you needed for your list, or it's an unusual hawk that you want to report for other birders to go look at. So you'd report it as an incidental because your primary purpose wasn't to go out and bird. You can also upload um, historical observations, which is a function that I haven't used before. Um, but if you've got a really cool sighting from 1945, you should upload it. <laughs> Um, you're going to enter your start time when you started birding, um, the duration of how long you birded for, as well as your party size, how many people were birding with you. Um, and finally, you're going to add checklist comments if you want, if you want to make comments about the weather, about conditions, about something cool you saw, um, like this person also saw a deer and maybe they lived in a city and the deer was really exciting for them. Um, and then last, you're going to import what you see or hear or enter what you see or hear. Um, so this gives you the species list, um, and this is organized by family, and you're just going to simply enter the number of each species that you saw. You can add details if there was some interesting behavior, if the bird was singing and it was a male singing, um, if bir birds were paired, if you saw fledglings, um, you can comment whatever you want, really. And then finally, before you click submit, you have to answer this question, are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? This doesn't mean that you went out and were able to identify every single bird. Not many people can do that. This just means that to your best ability, you were able to identify the birds that you've put in this checklist by sight and by sound. And complete checklists are always better data and more useful than our incomplete checklists. Um, so what are some elements of a quality checklist? These are some useful tips um, that help in, uh, for researchers to ensure some data quality. Um, shorter distances, typically less than five miles, are preferred as are shorter durations. 
New lists are recommended also each time you travel from a different habitat. So if you're going from a pine forest to a wetland, you want to stop your checklist when you end when you get to the end of the pine forest and start a new list when you enter um, into that wetland. A great example is um, St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, where they have a hotspot for the entire refuge, but then they have hotspots for each area within the refuge. And this just gives more accurate data on exactly when and where the bird was seen as opposed to just it being in this really large area. So you're always going to want to use those hotspots when they're available. You can create hotspots. If there's a park that you bird a lot at and it's not considered a hotspot, you can go ahead and make that a hotspot. You can name a personal location. If your backyard is awesome for wildlife and feeders, you can call it whatever you want, like the best bird buffet in town and name it that. Or you can upload your coordinates if you have those, if it's a very obscure place um, that you don't want to create a hotspot for. Complete checklists are also always preferred, like I said before. And again, you are reporting all the species that you, to the best of your ability, were able to identify by sight or sound. Um, one checklist per group is also recommended, which avoids double counting birds. eBird makes it really easy to share checklists just by email. And you can go in and if you saw different birds, even though you were out together, you can add or delete birds um, from that main checklist. So it's very simple and it's recommended. And then finally, um, you want to count or estimate the number of individuals you've seen instead of using just an X. And this is something since I started using eBird that I've noticed has gotten way better. It's really easy when you start counting birds and you get to 19, 20, 21, 22. Oh, I don't know, I'll just put an X. Whenever you can, it's always better to estimate or to actually count. You can make um, a comment under that species and say, I think I may have over or under, underestimated, and that's perfectly fine. But it obviously gives more information than X. X could be one, X could be infinity. So you might be thinking now, well, I'm a beginner birder. Um, shouldn't I wait to use eBird and tell them a little bit more advanced? Uh, no, you don't have to. Of course, there are tons of field guides and books and tutorials available, but one really awesome app that can provide immediately help when you're in the field is the Merlin Bird ID. This app was created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's free and really easy to use. Um, there are three options on it. The first is you can start a bird ID. So if you're out in the field and there's something you're looking at that you don't know, you can start the bird ID. It asks you questions based on uh, where you are, what color the bird was, what kind of habitat it was in, what kind of behaviors it had, and it will generate top suggestions based on your answers. The second option is if you have a picture of a bird that you don't know what it is. You can upload the photo, answer a few questions about the date and location, and it will also generate top suggestions based on those answers. These two functions have greater than 90% accuracy in identifying your bird, which is pretty incredible for an app and it's only getting better. So it's just a really helpful tool. Um, finally, the last option is to explore birds. And this is a function I use all the time. It gives you a list of species in your area. You download a pack for let's say Eastern North America and it gives you all of the species within Eastern North America. It'll provide you with photos of the bird to help with identification, uh, fall plumage, breeding plumage, juveniles, it provides a short description of the habitat, a range map so you know when the bird's going to be in your area, and also provides calls and sounds, and that's definitely what I refer to the most. It's really easy to forget some of those weird chip notes in the fall, and you can just pull out your phone if you hear a weird chip note, play what you think it is, compare that, and if you think it's your bird, awesome. If you don't, maybe you got to keep investigating. One of the things that comes up when we talk about something like eBird is how do who's who's making who's making sure that someone's not going out and being like, I saw 75 penguins yesterday. Um, who is that person or are those people real? Yes, they are. Um, there are eBird reviewers in various municipalities, states, counties, countries. It just kind of depends but there are hundreds of these people, eBird reviewers. And basically when you submit a checklist, it goes to them. That's why when you submit a checklist, if you do use eBird, sometimes it takes two or three days to get posted. That's why. And their job is to maintain that data quality to provide that one more level of scrutiny on data. And 
this especially comes in handy with rarities, right? This is why birders bird. I mean, that's why we bird. We're always looking for that next rarity. Uh, the fork-tailed flycatcher in this photo. We were in South Texas and of course it's been reported like every day for three and a half weeks or something. We go and it's not there anymore. That's the last day it was seen. But if we hadn't seen the fork-tailed flycatcher, despite all these people seeing it, it would have been flagged as rare. And that shows up on the mobile app like this. If you can see my cursor, there's a red dot that means it's unreported. And um, R in the box means rare. So if, if I'm out in my backyard and a saw wet owl is in a tree or something, it would be marked as rare. And I would have to defend that sighting. And that would require me to write down the field marks of that bird, its behavior, what habitat it was in, um, anything else that kind of gives that reviewer a sense of, yes, that's what it is. Most importantly, if at all possible, and sometimes I even take a, I saw a Western Kingbird in Florida a few weeks ago and it was a rarity. And so I took my binoculars and my cell phone and took it through the binoculars to get a diagnostic photo. I could have also recorded the sound on my phone. Um, those are really helpful to cinch down. Yeah, that's, that's the rarity that you say it is. Um, Checklists can also be flagged though, if you have misidentified photos, rarities like I mentioned, but unusually high counts. If I go out to Phipps Park right down the street and say, you know, yesterday I remember now, I saw about 290 cerulean warblers in the trees. I'd want to go. That is a, there is a 0% <laughs> chance of that being a thing. And so reviewers are going to be like, no, you didn't. You saw, you probably didn't see any bird of that abundance, but you certainly didn't see cerulean warblers like that. And eBird reviewers will actually reach out to you via email and contact you. They're, in my experience, always nice. And they just say, hey, can you provide more clarity or whatever? And it's a really cool system. Um, and if you're a great birder, which I know some of you on this are, um, that's something you might think about becoming an eBird reviewer. One of my favorite things to do, of, of the, there's two things I really like about eBird. And this is one of them is explore hotspots. And this is on the, the eBird page. You click explore and you go down here to explore hotspots. And hotspots, we haven't really defined those yet. Uh, hotspots are basically these dots. And they're places where birders have gone more than once and established as a site for birding. Um, so this is down in our area. You can see we have a lot of hotspots. And you'll notice the color differences. Gray, not many species. Blue, a little bit more. Green, a little bit more. Basically, as you get warmer, you get more species. So those oranges and reds are the hot spots. You can see St. George Island down here and Bald Point, St. Mark's, of course. And St. Mark's is the example I'm going to kind of dive into. So St. Mark's is red. You can see the little red thing. And I click on it, and this pops up. So I can click on the hot spot, get all kinds of information. Um, but I see right off the bat 334 species. Um, so that's a place I'm going to want to go if I'm visiting from out of town. I can click view details or click the name and it shows me what birds have been seen most recently. So if I'm planning a trip, I can look and say, hey, maybe I'll see a blue winged teal or maybe I'll, you know, get lucky and see the flamingo. Um, you can check all that out. You can see when birds were first seen. Uh, you can click on what I sometimes do is down here at the side, you can actually click on bar charts. That's super helpful because what bar charts do is they show you what birds would be most commonly expected during certain months. So if you're going somewhere, taking a trip to California or something, you can study before you go by checking those bar charts and understanding what birds you might expect to see. There's, there's a lot more to it, of course. Uh, there's a whole course in this and I'll get into that later, but um, exploring hotspots is just a lot of fun. It's a great way to find places, even if you're not birding, to just check out. Um, and explore. Uh, another really useful tool is the explore regions function. Um, and this is something that I use a lot, especially in my free time when I'm bored, I'll type in a random country and look at all the amazing birds they have there and then fantasize about going there. Um, but it's really useful to also look at what's happening on a local scale. So you can explore by county, state, province, or country. Once you've denoted where you want to explore, this page pops up. Uh, so for this example, it's Pima, Arizona. We can see there are sightings here, just like in the hotspots. These are the most recent sightings of species, uh, the observer, the location. If you click on the little date here, it'll show you the complete checklist. 
And we can see this area is pretty well birded, 472 species, uh, 309,000 checklists, 14,000 people have submitted checklists, and 377 hotspots, which is pretty impressive. It'll also display the top media or photos, audio recordings, and videos uploaded in the past seven days. And then below top media, I know it's kind of funky here because it's a screenshot, but below the top media will be recent visits. And again, you can click on those dates to look at more information about each checklist. Top eBirders, um, this is where it gets sort of competitive and fun. I used to do a lot more county listing than I do now. And I would refresh this top eBirder spot every few hours to see where I was in the ranking. And it's just kind of fun to make it competitive, but also if that's not your thing, that's totally fine too. And on the bottom, there are top hotspots. And this is a really useful tool. If you're going to somewhere completely new, you've never been there, you're like, where, where do I bird? Where am I gonna see the most species? Well, according to this, you might wanna go to Sweetwater Wetlands because there's been 307 species reported from there. Uh, a couple other good features on here. On the left-hand side, you can view your specific stats based on that region, um, your eBird list in that county, your needs alerts based on that county, and I'll describe what needs alerts are in a minute. And then finally, you can explore some uh, things specifically related to that county, like the hotspot map that will show you all of the hotspots within that area, bar charts like Peter just described, the top 100 uh, birders or the top 100 species. The most interesting to me is this rare bird alert. Um, this shows you the, the rare birds that have been reported there in the past seven days. So again, if you have never been to Pima County and you're like, well, what are some rarities I can see? Pop this up. It shows you exactly where it, saw, where it was seen and when. And so it's a really cool tool. Um, I mentioned that I had two things I really liked about eBird. This is my favorite. And this is exploring the species maps. So I mentioned that we did a big year last year, right? And so as we see species, it becomes harder and harder to see the new species. Well, we go to a place and the first thing I do is I go to species map here on the explore page. And this is what would pop up. So we're planning a trip, let's say to Minnesota. And I'd be like, well, I really wanna see a great gray owl and a pine gross beak and a boreal chicken. So I would type those species in and this would pop up. And basically blue means it's been seen there. Red means it's been seen there recently. And the difference between the big ones with the flame in the middle and the little points is that the little points are just individual locations, whereas the big ones are hotspots. So let's use this as an example. I wanna, I'm from Chicago and I fly down and I wanna see a brown-headed nuthatch. I've never seen one before. I type in brown-headed nuthatch in the species maps portion, and this pops up for Tallahassee. I'm flying into Tallahassee. I'm on the plane. Where do I go tomorrow to see this fur? Well, in this case, I'd look and I'd say, okay, well, brown-headed nuthatches are kind of intermittent around Tallahassee, but whoa, look down here at St. Mark's. There is a huge cluster of orange. Basically, if I'm a birder, and I go to St. Mark's, I've got a pretty damn good chance of seeing a brown-headed nuthatch. As long as I know the call and what I'm looking at, I'm probably gonna see that bird. And that's kind of how you can plan a trip. And, and you can do this anywhere in the world, you know, eBirds International. Sometimes I just nerd out and type in obscure species I'm interested in and look at them. Um, so it's a really, really cool tool. Another neat tool for some of the more avid birders or even some of the beginner birders that are really looking to beef up their list are the targets and alerts function. Targets can be set to provide the species needed for a particular region for your list. And you can also specify your list by region and then set it to your life list, your year list, your month list, etc. Alerts and needs are based on the most up-to-date information of species that have been seen by other observers. And this is sent via email. Uh, Peter and I both have our needs and alerts set. And uh, it can be really problematic when you are at work and you get your rare bird alert coming in saying that there is a buff-breasted sandpiper two hours away. And you have to then figure out how you're going to get from work to see that buff-breasted sandpiper in time before it flies away. So it's a really cool tool. Um, <laughs> it definitely makes birding more addicting as well. And then another useful feature that is not directly uh, connected with eBird, but is now related to eBird is the Macaulay Library. 
When you upload any media to your checklist, it immediately goes into this library, which is basically an archive. It's actually been around since 1929, but since eBird has launched, they've connected up. Um, it actually contains many taxa and not just birds, but the cool thing about it is that any media that you upload, photos, videos, or audio recordings automatically goes in the Macaulay Library. And this is used for research, conservation, education. As you can see, greater of oh, more than 1300 publications have utilized archives from this library. And it's really fun to just sit down, type in a random species and look at some of the really neat photos people have taken, the cool videos and audio recordings. And another neat thing about it is that people can go in and rank your photos. And if you have a really high quality photo, it actually has a chance of being on the cover of eBird. So it almost acts like Flickr in a way too, where you can share your photos and get feedback. Um, I hope you're not getting sleepy at this point like this Paraki because this is where it gets serious. Um, eBird is a really important tool for science. Over 300 peer reviewed publications have relied on eBird data and this uses those complete checklists that we mentioned earlier. This provides year round information on species and has helped to produce species distribution models showing where species are at certain times of the year and full life cycle information. In other words, it helps scientists observe where birds are and when, in what numbers, and that way they can better prioritize areas of conservation, species in decline, shifts in migration, and much more. Um, and so this is just a list of a handful of some of the scientific works that have been published using eBird this year. We can see that the reach truly is worldwide and ranges across a variety of topics. The tabs on the right hand are in eBird. If you go onto the science tab, and you can view statuses and trends of species, as well as downloading eBird products. If you're a researcher interested in getting um, some observations of some species, you can uh, download eBird data. And it also gives you best, uh, best practices to organize and analyze this kind of data. There's a tab on conservation impacts that shows some of the many ways that eBird data has informed conservation over the years, applied projects, uh, which are projects that eBird has partnered with. eBird's also creating a taxonomy list to better identify specific subspecies of birds. And there's a list of all of the publications that has been cited using eBird data. So it's a really fun, if you're a nerd, it's a really fun uh, page to just kind of go down and see all of the amazing things eBird has really done. It's, it's truly not just for birders, but also for research. And here's an example of one of those statuses and trends maps of one of my favorite songbirds to hear, the wood thrush. And so this is gonna show the migration northwards of the wood thrush with relative abundances uh, reaching higher numbers as it gets bluer and then across the different months of the year here. So let's play that. We can see them wintering down in South America, shifting upwards into their breeding range and then slowly coming back down. And it's really cool. And this is just one of many species that they've done this type of mapping for. Again, it's just really fun to go in and, and look at all the things that, I mean, this is all from eBird data, which is pretty impressive to me. So, um, hold on one sec, our, our little uh, thing got defeated. Um, speaking of science, you know, Probably most people on this call, on this Zoom, are interested in conservation in some capacity. Well, if you have science, that in turn should, in my opinion, inform conservation. So let's talk about how that's happened. Uh, this bird at the top, you all are probably thinking, maybe not all of you, but some of you are probably like, I've seen that bird. That's not rare. It's a red-winged blackbird. Wrong. This is a tricolored blackbird, much rarer. Um, when I lived out in Oregon, uh, I went out in my ornithology class and we got to see a flock, I think it was like 30,000 of these fly over Klamath Marsh in Northern California. And at the time I was like, how have I never seen this? This is so common. Only later did I learn, oh, that was like one of three or four flocks like that of that bird, that's it. Um, they're, they're declining really rapidly. And so eBird information was used to determine where, new, where nesting sites were and new ones were documented when they did a range wide study and those ultimately were protected, which is really cool. That's a cool example. Um, I work for Tall Timbers and I work in our land conservancy. 
Um, we're what's considered a land trust, which works with private landowners to conserve property. And the equivalent of us in Nova Scotia, one of their main ways of prioritizing areas to focus on for conservation is eBird. Think about it. If you've got a lot of species of birds somewhere, you probably have a lot of habitats. You probably have a lot of other species. Um, you probably have some intact habitat, depending on the birds you have. And so that's used to inform where to expend resources for conservation. Um, Oregon, uh, they've got a really cool thing. They're updating their strategic um, opportunity area plan, ODFW is. And they've used over 30,000 eBird observations to determine where to prioritize conservation moving forward. Um, I'll skip through some of these, but, but these are on the eBird website. You can read more about them. The one I want to mention and kind of dive deeper into is that last one, banning drones from Florida State Parks. This little cute guy down here who's a very smart bird because he knows what eBird is. Uh, this is a clapper rail. I love rails a lot. They're super cool. They're super secretive. Oftentimes you can only hear them, not see them. Um, and this clapper rail, like if you're at a place like St. Mark's or somewhere on the coast, you'll hear them, this weird kind of cackle. And that's how you find them. Well, birders in a state park in Central Florida were noticing that they weren't hearing them as much in prime habitat where they were before. What they were hearing was drones and seeing drones flying low over the salt marsh. And what they noticed was that where the drones were common, rails were just not calling. Well, as you all probably know, if you're a bird and you're not calling, eventually that's gonna catch up to you and your population is gonna decline. So basically a group of birders used that eBird data to prove to the legislature that drones were bad in state parks basically. And that ultimately was one of the key reasons why drones are now banned from Florida state parks. Pretty cool. I mean, I think that's a kind of neat example of, of this stuff actually working. Um, and that kind of ties into the last thing I'm gonna talk about, um, which is, basically one of the reasons why we're giving this talk and why one of the reasons why we're especially excited about eBird now. Um, where I work and where Heather works, Tall Timbers, recognized that there was a need. And that need was that we have a lot of birds that are declining, but we also have a lot of private lands, lands that are, I mean, Tall Timbers, over 140,000 acres of conservation land and other, excuse me, conservation um, land trusts around Florida and Georgia are in similar spans of conservation. So there's a lot of land and there's a lot of habitat, but we have very little, relatively speaking, understanding of what's on those lands. They're visited typically once a year, um, maybe twice a year for easement monitoring visits where the staff of the land trust goes out and checks for violations on an easement. Well, they've got other fish to fry. They're not birding the whole time in most cases. So in many respects, unless there's a specific research project being done, we don't know, maybe there's a new population of prothonotary warblers or you know, little blue heron rookery or something on these lands, we just don't know. And so what we did is Tall Timbers wrote a grant uh, to Cornell Lab of Ornithology and we're awarded that grant. And what it is, is it's basically a partnership grant. Three land trusts, Tall Timbers, Alachua Conservation Trust, and Conservation Florida, all Florida land trusts, um, are working with four Audubon chapters, us, Appalachia Audubon, Alachua Audubon, Orange Audubon, and West Volusia Audubon, to basically team up and tackle this issue. And so one of those things that's going to happen is that Audubon volunteers, you can see an example of this happening already. Uh, this is Alachua Audubon and Alachua Conservation Trust. They've already gone out four times. And what, the, what happens is, you know, for a conservation easement, you have to monitor it. And so land trust staff goes out and monitors. Meanwhile, the landowner or landowners join Audubon volunteers to bird the property. Hey, landowner, this is what you have and it's awesome. And they build that positive connection. They document the birds. Data is entered. eBird knows about it. The landowner's happy. A landowner actually gets a pair of really like $175 binoculars for participating. Um, so everybody's happy. The land trust has this great positive connection and partnership and it's worked out really well so far. And we're excited to implement it up here. Um, in addition, there's going to be some, some projects like creating a video about the benefit of, of these conservation lands that land trusts manage um, to birds. 
There's going to be field trips in some cases for the public to get to experience some of these properties they might not have ever experienced before. Um, and as it pertains to you all, I'm very excited to mention that of you watching, whether you live in an apartment, whether you have 500 acres somewhere, um, the first 10 of you that go to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and go to their courses and complete the free eBird training course, which is, they say it's three hours, it's really not. Um, and it's really interesting. It dives in much deeper than we did on like the whys of this stuff. The first 10 people that complete that course and submit a checklist from their property on eBird, a complete checklist and contact me, um, you will get a free uh, field guide, National Geographic uh, Field Guide to the Birds of North America, which is the field guide I use. And one of my favorites has every species of bird in North America in it. And I will mail it to you um, for doing that first time of you. So, um, and of course there's other ways to get involved as well. If, and I'll show you how. Um, if you get involved with basically any of these things on this resource page, and this recording will be available after the talk on our Appalachie.org website, um, there's ways to get involved. Maybe you haven't been um, as involved with your local Audubon chapter. Maybe you haven't been as involved with your local land trust. Um, and there's great ways to kind of plug you in, especially right now, which we're really excited about. Um, I also want to mention um, the last thing is, is different. That is uh, birds and brews. If you are interested in more birding adventures, Heather and I actually created a blog slash website to document our big year. We're missing the, a couple of the last few trips, but most of the stuff's on there. Um, these are some of the pictures from our trip. You know, we have Pine Grosbeak in Minnesota, buff belly hummingbird from South Texas, um, a common eider when we were freezing our butts off in uh, Eastern Massachusetts, all kinds of cool stuff. And you'll notice birds and brews. We, we are big fans of celebrating our successes, our failures, um, our moderate successes, our medium failures, our slightly, all that by drinking. We'll um, drinking. So we, yes, yeah, so we go to a lot of uh, breweries. We're big fans of going to breweries and we write about that. So anyway, if you're interested, you can check it out. Um, with that, we are wrapped up and I would now love to hear from all of you and I know Heather would too about any questions you have. So thank you very much for tuning in. Yeah, thanks everyone. And I hope all right. you like the photo. <laughs> all right, um, thank you everybody. Uh, so hello, my name is Dara Wilson. I'm the communications chair and I'm also the Zoom administrator for um, Appalachia Audubon. Um, so yeah, so thank you. We're gonna begin our Q&A section. Um, I have a after that, I have a lot of questions that I want to ask myself because I'm a, I'm not too, too familiar with eBird. I've even gone out with Peter myself trying to get acquainted with eBird, and that was really, really fun. Um, but uh, instead of asking all my many questions, I'll just save that and I'll ask Peter um, in private. Um, so let's get started with uh, all the questions that all our all our attendees have um, asked. So um, Peter, first question, how, how can we help children um, any real, any real age, but uh, specifically maybe ages five to seven use eBird? Yeah, great question. Um, to be perfectly honest, I've only had that experience a few times, probably like five or less times with kids using eBird, but I have done it. Um, basically, is kid, here's the thing. Kids know a lot more about technology than you think they do. Unless you have kids or work with them, I, I am here to tell you that they know how to use a smartphone just fine, even at the age of five. It's kind of scary, actually. But, um, you know, you just show them how to click the button. You, you let them know what they saw or you help them identify a bird and they click the button um, and they get to take part in science. They're, they become a scientist and I think they get really excited by that. Um, certainly when I was using iNaturalist, I still use iNaturalist a lot. I did that a lot with kids and I found very few problems of them understanding what was going on. I think there's there's ways to model and and demonstrate differently, and I think there's things that work better than others. But certainly, I would say with kids, your problem isn't going to be them understanding the app or the website. It's going to be um, sitting still with binoculars and using binoculars to identify birds. That's that's where the education piece needs to be weighted towards, in my in my opinion. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay. And speaking of binoculars, do you have um, a recommended pair of starter binoculars? 
Yeah. Um, so ironically, people think if I'm starting a hobby, I should get something cheap because if I'm not really into it, then I've wasted this money. With birding, if you buy a really cheap, crappy pair of binoculars, you're going to inevitably have not a great time because you're going to be squinting in those binoculars and not be able to see anything great. So I would recommend spending at least $100 on a decent pair. Um, my recommendation, and I know there's tons of companies out there. I personally really like Vortex because they have a super great warranty. They're really durable. I use them in the field all the time. You can throw them across the street and they're fine. And if they break, they'll send you a new pair for free. So it's amazing. And they're really not that expensive. I mean, you can get up into the thousand range if you want to, but most of us are, are sticking lower than that. And they have some great pairs for like $130 and you can probably get them on sale for like 120. So there's, there's options there. Okay, sweet. That's my pair. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. I um, love, I have Vortexes too. I just same. made the switch this year and I am glad. Nice. Um, okay. Do you, uh, do you need a, do you need a separate account for the mobile app and for the computer or can you use, all right, same, okay. same account. All righty. Um, so one, one, um, one user, uh, asked or one excuse me one attendee uh, mentioned that they uh, they've been going out to Lighthouse Road and they've been starting to put what they see on eBird um, and they created a location. However, um, there are several hot spots on already along the road and they don't know how to put a species count on on their list and on the hot spots. So, do you have any recommendations or tips for them? Sure. Um... Lighthouse Road is a long road. I think it's eight or nine miles. Um, and that's kind of goes back to what we were saying. Probably 90 plus percent of the people that go to St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, which is amazing if you haven't been, um, go to Lighthouse Road. And so it's huge. And if you just say Lighthouse Road, nobody knows where. And so uh, whoever submitted that question is exactly right. You want to be more specific. And so along Lighthouse Road, if you're using the app, you click on your location and it will tell you what you're closest to. So it might be East River Pool, it might be Mounds Pool 1, it might be Tower Pond. All those options, pool next to Lighthouse, all those options will pop up. And as long as you are paying attention to the signs around you, it should be no problem to determine where you are. And that's the, that's the hot spot you would want to select. And you would just enter your data in just like in any other hot spot. You just, you have a location, you have your list of birds, you enter in the birds, click submit, and you're good to go. So um, one of the things with that that I'll add is, if you remember, I was mentioning the explore hotspots function, and I said it was easier to investigate on the desktop. If you open the desktop, meaning like on a computer, and explore hotspots before you get started going to St. Mark's, it's a lot easier to determine spatially where you are and where the hotspots are. And that's some advice I would, I guess, offer is dig into that ahead of time. I think you'll be you'll have an easier time when you actually get down there. Okay. Um, ooh, okay. I didn't see this question. Does eBird connect with Project Feeder Watch? I believe- Are you familiar with Project Feeder Watch? Cornell it's through Cornell. I don't think they necessarily have any kind of connection, but the Feeder Watch program is based through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which are the founders of eBird. Yeah. Okay. Oh, point of clarification while I see it in the chat. Um, and Kim, who I work with, is correct. We, we are not necessarily checking conservation easements for violations. We will mark them if we see them, but we're actually checking for just compliance. We're just checking. That's why our land trust staff goes out to easements. We're just making sure that the conservation values of the property are still there. So that is a good point, Kim. Thank you for that. Got it. Ooh, um, I wonder if um, I see, because of this last name, I wonder if there is a there is a relation. Um, how can you tell the age of birds while birding? And also, can you tell if there is, um, if it is a male or a female? And um, is there a specific name? Um, uh, how can, is there, is there a name for that? Like, how can you distinguish between male or females? So the name of distinguishing them is sexual dimorphism. That's like the scientific term for it. So sexual, sexual dimorphism is not present in all species. For some it is, uh, like a cardinal, all your male cardinals are gonna be bright red and your females are gonna be a bit of that rustier brown orange. 
And that's a really easy one to see, but it's not true for all birds. A lot of songbirds it's true for, and similar to having that bright colored plumage, a lot of male songbirds also will sing, whereas the female will not sing. Um, granted, we're learning that a lot more females do actually sing than we thought before, but generally it's males that sing and males that are brighter. Again, it's not true for all birds. That kind of mostly pertains to songbirds or uh, pastoreed birds. Um, to the question of, what was the other part of that? Juven marking juveniles. Oh, you can identify, it takes a pretty advanced birder to be able to do that. And sometimes you can't do it at all unless you've got the bird in your hand. There are ways to denote juveniles from adults based on the plumage, but that's so specific to whatever the species is that you'd have to just research it beforehand. And the great thing about a lot of the field guides we use, Sibley, uh, Nat Geo, they have those juvenile plumages. And so if you mm -hmm. have one of those field guides, that's what I was saying. Birding is great because it's constant education. I mean, you're always learning and teaching yourself. And yeah. that's one that can trip you up. If you see a small white heron, you might think, oh, it's just a snowy egret. But if you're not checking carefully, it could be a juvenile little blue heron. You know, there's things like that where yeah. it's really important to double check. And I will say a lot of the birds that are sexually dimorphic, a lot of the juvenile males of those birds will look like females. So it makes it kind of hard to distinguish between the two. Um, but again, there are ways, it gets pretty specific though. Yeah, that was a really good, that was a really good question. All right. That's a good question. Who, who asked that? You said maybe. Um, that was, that was from Renee Levy. Thanks, Mom. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, do you have a favorite CD for learning bird calls? Hmm. I, you know, I, when I took ornithology um, at Miami, where I went to undergrad, we actually had a DVD. Now, now computers don't even have DVD players, but I still have the DVD. And you basically can like generate quizzes of calls. And that's how we had to know, believe it or not, we had to know 150 calls in my class. Um, I forgot. 90% of those, but um, that's how we studied it. And there are programs like that. There's websites that have built-in quizzes. Um, you know, like we mentioned, the Merlin app, just going out and when you hear something, playing what you think it might be and comparing, that's a great way to learn because you're out there with it, hearing it in the context of everything. I think that's really, to me, that's really helpful. But as far as a specific CD, um, I've, I know specific CDs for frog calls, um, but I don't necessarily have one for birds. Yes, you do. I don't. Yeah, I actually haven't utilized CDs very much. Mostly use the Merlin Bird ID app to check on my calls and songs. Got it. Um, okay, uh, let me see. Um, Um, let me see. Um, eBird will also give you GPS coordinates and you can, uh, that was just comment. Um, eBird will also apparently give you GPS coordinates and you can name it. Um, that's a very good point. Nice. Thank you. Um, I, I have a personal question. Um, do you all, uh, what is your favorite, um, field guide? Just like a book. Mine, like that? I said, is uh, the Nat Geo Birds of North America. I think it's in its seventh edition now. Every time a bird is added to the North American list, it gets added. There's a new edition, um, and it's it's fan. I think it's fantastic. I've, I actually have four copies because I keep wearing through them and take them out and about. So I personally really like Sibley's. Um, Peterson's also great. There's always a huge debate between Sibley's guide and Peterson's guide, but. I personally really like Sibley's and I've got the one for all of North America and then one for Eastern North America. Mm -hmm. I like Peterson too. Oh, great. Well, is there anything, um, is there anything that we missed or that, um, is there anything else that you would like to share that you hadn't? Um, I mean, if there's other questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, I see one here about where in town should you begin birding? Um, you know, I guess that's something to mention is just like for people, regardless of where they live, um, I know there's some people from various places here. Um, I would say, I would say that um, that species function I mentioned on the website or the explore hotspots function are going to be a really great tool because they will show you 
where the most birds are. You can start there. And then if there's something after you go to those places that you really want to see, um, let's say you're in Oregon, uh, where I used to live, and you want to see, you know, one of the rare birds out there was a great gray owl, and everybody seemed to want to see one, rightly so, because it's one of the coolest birds in existence. Um, you know, you could look up that species. Now, some species are obscured. Actually, the great gray owl you couldn't find because it kind of blocks out where specifically they're being seen because they're so prone to disturbance. But something like a white-headed woodpecker, you could type it in and you could go right there and have a decent shot of seeing one. So my advice to those people getting into it or wanting to see something specific would just be to dive into those species maps and explore hotspot functions I mentioned. Or if you're brand new to an area and just want an all around good spot, checking out those top hotspots in whatever county you're near or in is also useful. Yeah. Actually, I'm sorry, I have, I have two more questions. One, because um, someone, it seems someone's having an issue with their account. Um, if someone is having an issue with their account, um, how could they fix that? There's technical support mm -hmm. on eBird. I would just contact them and I, I've uh, given feedback. That there was a change not too long ago that made eBird a lot harder to read. They've since changed it, but I sent a little thing and I was like, hey, can I go back to the way it was? It was a lot easier to read. Um, and they were, they responded like three hours later. So I would just say, if you have technical issues, just contact the technical support. And in my experience, they've been awesome. So go that okay. way. Well, sweet. All right. And finally, um, is it, is it possible to contact listers on eBird? Unfortunately not. So we were saying it's kind of like social media, but you can't really contact people unless they choose to put their email on their profile, which I like to do in case, you know, somebody wants to connect with me in bird or anything like that. Um, so unfortunately not, that could be something that might change, but it might, might also be people's preferences to keep it not, you know, like social media. Yeah. So it just, it depends on the user if they want to display their information. And while we're on that subject, I should mention, um, if anybody has questions or whatever, I know we put our emails up briefly. Um, you can put them back up. Yeah, this will be, this will be uh, available. And honestly, I think our emails are actually on the Audubon site already. So just know if you have something you think of later, you can feel free. I mean, we're, we don't care. Contact us whenever. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I think we're done. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody for attending um, so much. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate this. Um, so yes, until until further notice, this is how we'll be doing our our programs. Um, we really appreciate this. Um, so yes, and thank you so much, Peter and Heather, um, for this incredibly informative program. And we'll be seeing you on eBird. Sounds good. Yeah, All right. Bye, you. everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you. Good evening, everyone.